for pulses. We, we don't get to the targeted, we mostly get ionization. Now, if you look at the optimized pulse, we get an enhancement relative to the, the gas pulse of, the, of 10 to the minus 5. However, we mostly uh, have more depopulation of the ground state, which a lot of that goes to ionization, but still at the account for the ionization, we have a 10 to the 3 enhancement relative to the ionization. So that's, I would say, already a significant achievement, and we have, Lauren has recently repeated these calculations with the true mean field potential in the calculation of the hydrogen ground state. And the picture actually holds, even though the physical uh, meaning of the <coughs> um, involved is quite different. So we still get for the 10 to the 5 absolute enhancement and 10 to the 3 relative enhancement. This is just a comparison. So of course the question is what does this optimized pulse do better than the naive pulse? First of all, it's more intense, about 16 times more intense, as you can also see from this comparison of the two spectra here. We have some low frequency components added, but these are turn out to be not important. We can eliminate them and get more or less the same result. However, what you see is that the two pulses overlap in time. So this is the high frequency component. This is the low frequency component corresponding to the pump and this to the um, Stokes. And you'll see that they overlap in time, but the, um, the Stokes pulse comes much later in time. And this sort of delay seems to be crucial um, to get to this enhancement that we have observed. Okay, with this I come uh, to my conclusion. I would say that these first results of optimal control for Raman transitions is quite encouraging. We still need to understand the role of the delay. And as a general uh, message for this talk for you to take home with, is I think that there are prospects for control either out of or via a continuum. If there's no structure at all, then the best that you can do is either find common filtering or beat the losses by sufficiently fast passage. But if you do have resonances, this actually provides a handle for control. And I think we should use this resource and we should keep in mind that these resonances can be engineered to make their effect even larger um, and help more help. Okay, let me thank the people who are part of this work from my group, especially Daniel Reich, here are Michael Thompson over there, Martin Bergmann. Then the Bergman Cold Photo Association was done together with Rosario Gonzalez from Granada. The Hot Photo Association, the experimental party, the Laura Amitai group at the Technion, at the initial calculations by Robert Moschinski in Poland. And the dynamics was done together with Ronnie Kossoff in Jerusalem. And as I said, the recent work on XUV Lama transitions was done together with Lauren and uh, Brigitte Haweli, and please see Lauren's most important. Thank you for your attention. Questions? The, the last result you showed us with the uh, pulse sequence for the uh, Raman, I, I, I want to understand better. I mean, this is really the opposite of a stay wrap pulse sequence. In other words, your, 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 your Stokes pulse is turned on <coughs> last and your pump pulse is turned on first. So uh, is this... Is this are these small pulse areas or are they? Uh... That's exactly the question that I asked Lauren today. Um, I think he, in, in his calculations he tried to keep to intensities which are not completely unrealistic. But I think we should also, just for, for the sake of understanding, explore really large uh, pulse areas just to see whether we, in that limit, we do recover still, you know, which I would expect. I would, I would assume we must. I just have a question. Uh, you have a red uh, shell resonance or facial resonance. Uh, of course, the shell resonance is usually broader. But which one is more efficient? If you go through the shell resonance, resonance or go through the uh, uh, facial resonance? I, I, okay. I think it's not so much the width of the resonance mm -hmm. matters, but the position. Because the position determines for what kind of dynamics is so the reason why ultra cold people like flashback resonances so much is that the, the, the splitting between hyperfine levels, which are coupled in the in the flashback resonance, matches pretty much the, the collision energies, and that's why the dynamics completely dominate by, by the flashback resonance. While the shape resonance is really far away, and you have to work really hard to get into to these temperatures. But of course, I mean, in the uh, example of the shape resonance which I showed, this was for 88 strontium, which doesn't have any hyperfine manifold. So there are no flashback resonances. Mm -hmm. And in that case, you can always resort to shape resonances. Mm -hmm.
So is this technique being used by, by the core Arab community to get the association with the Brahms there already? Or is there still so there, there, there have been experiments showing the influence of shape resonances on total association back in the 90s. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But in Movidium, where it occurs at the, temper at the temperature not too far from the mod temperature, 300 microcalvin. So far it hasn't, it hasn't been used in this experiment. Uh, yes. I mean, would your optimization algorithm also produce, let's say, as an extreme limit, a pulse train? Or is it not within the reach of the algorithm? The reason I'm asking is that if, if you want to populate a state which is not populated before, and you have a re-amplitude sitting there, and you come again, then this is, of course, you know, a nonlinear amplification of the process. So I would expect almost an exponential gain if nothing else goes wrong. Of course, things go wrong. But uh, if you would come with a train, Actually, the, 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 it depends. Okay, one of the parameters of the optimization that you have to set by hand before is the overall time. And whether you find such a, a sequence of, of pulses depends, of course, on the overall time. And if this overall time is large enough, you do find uh, sequences of, of pulses. It's actually quite common, a quite mm -hmm. common feature mm -hmm. of optimized pulses. Okay, Thomas, go just to this because it already seems like it goes towards a pulse frame in this presentation a little bit, right? <coughs> And another thing that I want uh, is, is this somehow comparable to also like almost like doing a stir up in the continuum? Couldn't you just by inducing a resonance in the continuum and sweeping it through sort of this threshold of the continuum, couldn't you just capture this? And isn't this also what the Cold Allen guys always do? What you said for creating in a way? the um, molecular condensates or whatever? That's exactly the message that you should take from this talk, but I have to admit we haven't done it yet. Okay, so you could use any resonance, basically. Could you also take a bound state resonance, not just a shape resonance, but just one of the bound states that you project out? Not, it's not projecting it down in the laser, but just projecting if it up. If you can couple to it, I think you could, yeah. Okay, it should work. That was a very nice talk. I have just one brief comment at the beginning. Your motivation, you said that there was not a single experiment on the <laughs> clear control of a bimolecular reaction. I strongly disagree because there is one such experiment done by Patrick Nimberg and Gustav Gerber. It was published a couple years ago in PNAS uh, where they controlled the bimolecular reaction between carbon monoxide and molecular hydrogen producing several different organic molecules, large molecules, which are... In the gas phase or in solution? In the gas phase, gas phase surface reaction, yeah. And uh, depending on the spectral phase, they could manipulate which products occur, which uh, reaction products occur, with which abundance, and it's very uh, analyzed in that paper and in the follow-up paper. So it, uh, ma many people somehow seem <laughs> to forget that this was done, but it is a very nice event. It's not mine, but... Mm. It's very good. Okay, David. Um, I, I know you, you, you focus mostly on, on, on optimal control, uh, but you mentioned this part we talked about the local local control. And so one of the things that could be interesting <coughs> is to try to look at this well on process using local control, and and you may in fact find that a, a kind of a steering mechanism comes out automatically when you do that. You steer up through the continuum. Okay, you, you say that local control will enhance the amplitude automatically as so much that you go ahead. That's true. Maybe you should do it. Thank you. Okay, move back. I was wondering, you seem to be allowing for arbitrary modifications of the pulses in the temporal profile and the spectral profile. And I was wondering if there's cases where you can limit this to, say, standard pulses of which you then apply possibly a large number. And, and I'm asking because if you play simply numerically with uh, vibration of a effect in diatomic molecules and didn't want to increase the parameter space too much. So you said we take standardized pulses of a given uh, maximum intensity, of a given pulse length, and all we play with is the number. So there might be a train, not equally spaced in time. Um, and, and that's basic. And observe numerically that actually a large degree of control could be observed. For instance, we would start with a front 
on the milk packet, uh, and then ask the question, can we heat it, can we cool it, can we stop it into some vibration states? And then, by using sufficiently many of these standardized pulses, we would not get arbitrarily close, but we would get to, say, 90% into a predetermined stationary final state. Sure, I mean, the point is, once your problem is controllable, there usually are many, many, many solutions. I mean, depending on how much intensity you allow and so on, but there's, there's typically more than one. And then it depends on how you ask which solution you find. So if you only allow for a certain uh, parameterized form, then you'll, you'll find that solution. Uh, one thing that we have pursued that I didn't talk about today is that we, that we can limit the bandwidth of the pulse and then uh, find pulses that are, let's say, always keep to the 110 per second uh, bandwidth limit or things like this. So not, still not par parameterized, so that everything else is uh, at the liberty of the optimization algorithm, but the bandwidth would just penalize by an additional constraint. Okay. Uh, you didn't discuss local uh, control, uh, but perhaps you could just give us a general idea of the difference between global optical control and local optical control and what, which one one chooses in, in a given problem. Okay, so in global control, I essentially told you, you're really you're doing an iterated solution of the control uh, equations, which means that you're propagating your initial state forward and your target state backward, and you match them at the intermediate time, and you do this iteratively many, many times, so that you really use the information from the whole time interval. In local control, you're propagating only once, and you impose two conditions that correspond to your objective, your control objective, and these two conditions yield an equation for the phase and for the amplitude of the field. And David Tanner is really one of the people who, who developed this, uh, this method and was probably a much better reference than I am. And what is nice about local control is that it typically finds solutions which are very intuitive, like it can't find a uh, steerer, whereas optimal control sometimes has difficulties in, in finding certain solutions that you would expect. However, it often leads to extremely strong pulses. So there is a trade-off between, okay, you see what is the mechanism, but you will not be able to use this pulse, take it to the experiment, and just apply it. Extremely strong in the sense that it doesn't exist experimentally, or that uh, the system blows up, or what? Well, just that, that it's a very strong pulse. It doesn't blow up. I mean, in, in reality, it's, this is still within the stable regime. That's, that's not the just that it, that it, it becomes uh, unphysically strong. If, if I can just put a, a comment to that, but the, as, as Christiana said, the, uh, the, the global control, you go forwards and backwards in time. So what it means is that, is that you, you know about the future because you've come backwards from the end and you do this iteratively. And that allows you, because you know about the future, it allows you to sacrifice so your objective may go down at intermediate times because you know the future, and that will help you go up at the end. In local control, you, it's guaranteed, it, it's, the strategy is to go monotonically up. So you don't make any sacrifices at intermediate times. You just do at every instant whatever is best. Okay, I think with that, I wish you thank, uh, stop on the afternoon session here, and thank our speaker.